Well, let's bow our heads and just ask the Lord to guide us as we go into his word this morning. Father, we thank you for this Independence Day, for uh, the celebrations of yesterday and all this weekend, this chance to stop and remember the, the great gift of freedom that others dared to dream and dared to fight for and dared to put their lives on the line for, uh, perhaps never ever even beginning to under, imagine the uh, magnitude of a change that they would make by taking their stand uh, over 200 years ago. And we live in that, in that legacy, in that reality, and our nation has been able to help fight for the freedom of others uh, on so many different occasions. And Lord, we need to be mindful of that freedom today, both in our culture, in our society, in our country, but also in our personal lives. And we know that uh, in your word we find uh, the secret to an even deeper freedom, the freedom to be what you made us to be. And Father, I pray as we go into your word now that that will become even more clear for us. In Jesus' name, amen. On July 4th, 1776, delegates from 13 British American colonies signed the birth certificate for a new nation that would come to be known as the United States of America. That birth certificate was in the form of a grand and solemn de declaration, what we know as the Declaration of Independence. And while we rightly see that declaration as something that severed political ties with, with Britain and her king, the rationale for the Declaration of Independence goes much deeper than politics and the commerce between these two entities some 239 years ago. If you look at the very beginning of the Declaration of Independence, you find that it doesn't just talk about politics. It doesn't just talk about taxes. It doesn't just talk about things that the mother country did that were not fair or right to the colonies. It addresses a deeper issue the question of what it means to be truly human. And it does so in a way that points to a brand new identity. Listen to these words from the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evidence that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those are familiar words to us. Those were absolutely life-changing, radical words 239 years ago. When people dared to say that human beings have the right to become and be what God made them to be versus what a king said they had to be or what a state said they had to be. All men, all people are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These words describe the goal of creating a society in which people could become what God meant for them to be. And Paul would have appreciated, and I think he would have loved, the spirit of the Declaration of Independence. In fact, the letter that we're looking at for the, the next several weeks, the, the letter of, uh, to the churches in Galatia, Galatians, was in many ways just that, a Declaration of Independence a declaration of a new identity for human beings in which they were finally set free from the destructive slavery of sin and death. Writing to the Romans, another letter that he wrote, he explained in verse, chapter 8, verse, uh, verse 21, that because the creature itself shall also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into, he says, the glorious liberty of the children of God. Liberty, independence, freedom, a new identity that allows you to become what God meant for you to be. For Paul, that deliverance into the glorious liberty of the children of God was nothing less than a new exodus. You remember the old exodus, the original exodus journey had set Israel free from Pharaoh. The people of Israel, the Hebrews, were slaves and were being systematically destroyed through a, a, a form of genocide by the killing of all male infants. And they were forced to build cities and make bricks and so on, but also they were being undermined so that they would no longer exist as a people. But God came and set them free and took them on a journey out of sin and death and slavery 
into a brand new identity. When you read the Exodus story, you find it wasn't just about getting out of Egypt. It wasn't just about changing your political circumstance. Central to going into the desert on that Exodus journey was that God's people would find a brand new identity. They would be called God's son. They would be called God's children. And from then on, God would be their father, and they would have his identity instead of that of some pharaoh who was forcing uh, his own will upon them. Now, in writing to the Galatians, Paul's saying the same thing. He's saying that there's a new Exodus journey, a brand new journey, and with it comes a brand new identity. You think about what's going on in your life and about the challenges you face and what it means to follow Jesus in your life. Yes, it means walking away from certain things. It means being set free from certain things. It means finding God's freedom. But even more importantly, it means finding God's identity for you, that you can become the person God meant for you to be. Your identity is what makes you able to make your mark on the world. The Declaration of Independence pointed the way for a brand new country to give its people a brand new identity with a brand new set of freedoms so that they could go make their mark on the world. You look at the story of our country. From 1776 onward, our country set forth and the people of our country set forth to do things that nobody had ever imagined were possible. Yes, they made mistakes along the way, but they also accomplished things that caused the people back in Europe to just shake their heads in, 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 in disbelief. How could a bunch of ragtag people way off on the other side of the ocean Without any, you know, without any established cities and established infrastructure, go out and create this vibrant and amazing country, which even to this day is the, is the envy of the whole world. Past 239 years, we've seen that our country has made great strides in fulfilling the words of the Declaration of Independence. But we've also learned and continue to learn that no human system can ever set us free. No matter how much we work on that as a country, and we need to, no matter how hard we work to fulfill the words of the Declaration of Independence that all men and all women, that people of all races, people of all backgrounds, people of all ethnic groups be treated as equals, we'll always find we have more work to do than we can ever get done. Human nature is such, as we'll see in just a moment, that we always end up sorting people according to whether they're like us or not like us, we always sort people into various tribes and groups. We default back into suspicion and fear, and people come in and even take advantage of, of new rules and new laws to create new power structures so that those that were dominated before can now dominate and get even with those that had been their overlords in the past. We don't really get to the equality that we need to find in any human system. To experience the glorious liberty that Paul describes, we need to join him in the new exodus journey. And it's not a journey for the faint of heart. Of course, the Declaration of Independence didn't come out of nowhere. Uh, there was a story that led up to the right at signing of the Declaration of Independence, and there was an even bigger story that unfolded afterwards. Of course, it was the story of a long-running tension between England and her colonies that had built up over decades and decades of various offenses and problems and difficulties. And once the Declaration of Independence was signed on July 4th, 1776, and the Liberty Bell rang, then the real action began, what would become the Revolutionary War, the War of Independence. Like I said, Exodus journeys are not for the faint of heart. If you've ever tried to step out of the things that were holding you down and holding you back and preventing you from being the person God meant for you to be, you may have had a moment of exhilaration when you realized that you were set free, but then you found out the real work began. <laughs> I didn't know it would be this hard. <laughs> and Exodus journeys are hard journeys. They're terrifying journeys. In fact, if you aren't afraid on that journey, you probably aren't journeying. You aren't getting it yet. Because that kind of deep change that God does in our lives is disruptive to ourselves and to everybody around us. Same was true for Paul and the churches in uh, in Galatia, to which he wrote his letter. Paul had proclaimed a good news that did an amazing thing. He welcomed both Jewish people and Greek-speaking Gentile people, non-Jews, into God's family. 
To become God's child required but one thing, faith in what Jesus had done for us. Faith in what Jesus had done on our behalf. Now, it's almost impossible for us as Gentile, most of us Christians, some 2,000 years after Paul wrote, to grasp how radical this idea was in his time. The original Exodus people, the Jews, had been commanded by God to adopt a very unique identity, one that marked them out as God's family. It involved eating only certain foods. It involved honoring the Sabbath day in a very, uh, a very deliberate and very obvious way. And it involved circumcising all male children so that at least the males in the, uh, the Jewish family would all be marked out as God's people. And everyone in the family would be, would be identified then uh, as part of God's Exodus people. In fact, if a, if a man wanted to convert to Judaism, uh, he would have to undergo that same rite so as to become part of the people of God. Now, inevitably, this issue was bound to come up as Christians spread the good news all around the Mediterranean world to both Jews and Gentiles. The Greek people considered circumcision to be uh, a, a sort of abomination, a mutilation of the human body, and they had nothing to do with it. And it was, it, of course, to them, it, that had nothing to do with faith and with following God. In any event, it wasn't part of their heritage. And so uh, N.T. Wright writes to us about the book of Galatians. He says, a good deal of Galatians hinges on the fact that circumcision was the key issue almost to the point of obsession in the churches where Gentiles had become members, including, of course, the churches founded by Paul himself. Now get these words. It was all a question of identity, of knowing not only who you, yourself, you, who you were yourself, but who else belonged to your group, your tribe, your ethnic family. This thing of circumcision, as well as the dietary rules and keeping the Sabbath, were what we call tribal markers. They marked out who was part of the group and had done so for thousands of years for the Jewish people. And Jewish people had died terrible deaths because they refused to give up those markers. When two Jewish people met each other, no matter how large the crowd, no matter how far away from home they were, they could figure out that they were of the same group just by maybe a brief conversation, if it had anything to do with food, they'd figure it out really quickly. If it had to do with not working on the Saturday or Sabbath, they would pick it out immediately. Maybe you've had that experience when you've been somewhere, maybe on vacation or whatever, or maybe you've just been in, out in the community and you've met a stranger and you had that funny feeling, I think they're a Christian. You ever had that experience? You couldn't say why exactly. I mean, nobody was wearing a big shirt, you know, or had a bumper sticker on their car or whatever, but you just kind of picked up the vibes and you know, you dared to kind of say a little something that if they're a Christian, they'll know what I'm talking about. And they responded in kind, and then you had fellowship there. It's because you're the same tribe. And tribes, tribal members have ways of finding each other. We can tell who's part of our group and who isn't. Well, for the Jewish people, from as long as they could remember, this issue of uh, the, the circumcising of their male children, of all males, was the tribal marker. And you knew you belonged to God if that was your reality. So now what happens if God starts to do a new thing? If God expands the family to say that non-Jews, people not even of that heritage at all, can come and be part of the family if they believe in Jesus? What do you do with the old tribal markers? That's the issue of the book of Galatians. And it's an issue that challenges us to ask the question, what is the basis of our identity as Christians? Should Gentiles be required to adopt Jewish identity in order to join a new exodus? Or is this a radical new exodus where the old markers are no longer necessary? Now, the issue came to a head in the city of Jerusalem. Actually, it came onto the floor in the city of Jerusalem. You might think of it as a fight for freedom that was fought in two cities. And in chapter 2 of the book of Galatians, Paul talks about these two places. One of them is Jerusalem. The other one is a city 300 miles to the north called Antioch. Paul had been working among Gentiles, bringing them to faith. 
not requiring them to join the Jewish tribe in order to be followers of Jesus. This was a new exodus, not a remake of the old exodus. But his approach was not without its critics. And as a result, he went to Jerusalem to meet with the big guns, the, 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 the first leaders of the Christian movement. And he says in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, after 14 years, I went up to Jerusalem again, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders. I presented to them the gospel that I preach among Gentiles. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. He explains that in bringing Titus, he was setting up a kind of test because Titus was one of those new Christians, those new people of God, uh, individuals who was a Greek. The name Titus is a Greek name. And he's, he was a man who had not been circumcised and yet was part of the Christian family. And he says in verse 3, yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised even though he was a Greek. A Greek. Well, what Paul's saying is, I brought this Gentile along with me who believes in Jesus, who is filled with God's Spirit, who is just like the rest of us in this new Christian walk, and those conservative, even somewhat hardcore, first-generation Jewish believers welcomed him into the family. Nobody said, we have to make the old Exodus journey. They all understood we're making a new journey, brand new identity of all of us being one in God's family, regardless of our background. Paul tells us that the reason that this issue came up in the first place was because he had been under severe criticism by people who wanted to roll back the clock. Verses 4 and 5, he says, this matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. Now, that's the language of undoing an exodus. That's the language of finding free people and putting them into slavery versus finding slave people and taking them into freedom. He said, here we were doing this new thing that God had called us to do, declaration of independence, brand new people, brand new kingdom, God's kingdom come. Unfortunately, there were people who came and said, we've got to figure out how to take all of these liberated Gentile people and put them back in the old way of thinking and the old way of acting. He says, we did not give in to them for a minute so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. You see what's going on there. Freedom is never free. The freedom that you have is yours only if you're willing to fight for it, only if you're willing to stand up for it. And Paul could see that great freedom. He had been affirmed by the brothers in Jerusalem, but there were those who nonetheless would dedicate their entire lives to undermining what he was doing just to take away something from someone else and say, you have to have my identity. You can't have this new identity in Jesus. It's quite a sobering lesson for us, something that comes up when we raise our kids, something that comes up in our marriages, something that comes up in our relationships with each other. Am I willing to let God reveal the true identity of the people I'm with? Or am I going to impose my idea of what they ought to be on that? What does it mean to make your mark in the world? Does it mean that you leave your fingerprints all over everybody else and force them to look like you, think like you, act like you? Or does it mean we sit back and say, God, you're doing a new thing? I can imagine James and John those, and Peter, those first leaders of the Christian movement, Jewish men, men who had suffered for Jesus, men who were leading a, a Jewish fellowship, a Jewish congregation in a very dangerous city, looking at this Titus and going, I don't get it, but it's got to be God. They refused to put their hands on what God was doing. It's a challenge, a challenge for each of us. I know when your kids get old enough to think for themselves, they're no longer just sort of, if they ever did, doing what you told them to do. 
And they start to make their own decisions, and they start to push back on things that you hold very dear. And, and perhaps they head off in some directions that you know aren't going to necessarily work out very well. What do you do? Do you cut them off? Do you spy out their freedom? Do you lecture them? Do you try to force your way, your thinking upon them? Or do you pray that God will birth in them that new identity that he has? Affirming freedom is one thing. Living it out is something else. Those apostles in Jerusalem told Paul, you're okay, you can go work with the Gentiles, we'll work with the Jewish believers. And it all sounded good on paper, but it was very soon put to the test. You know, it was one thing for our founding fathers to write the Declaration of Independence and affirm that all men are created equal. It was something else for our nation to figure out how that works. It was four score and seven years after the writing of the Declaration of Independence, 87 years, almost to the day that the United States of America, caught up now in a horrible civil war, found itself, brother against brother, north versus south, fighting the most devastating battle of the entire war, the Battle of Gettysburg. And some months later, Abraham Lincoln came to the battlefield where 50,000 American soldiers had died over a battle about what it meant for all men to be created equal. Lincoln concluded his brief address, the Gettysburg Address, with these words that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. You have to fight for freedom. Freedom isn't free. Freedom has to be born. And it has to be born again in new situations, new situations in our country's life. As we are seeing over this past year with uh, all of the, the issues and debate, debates over various aspects of what it means to be free in our society, Paul understood that just because some people said he was okay in a formal and polite meeting in Jerusalem did not mean that that would necessarily work out on the ground. And in fact, we know that uh, sometime after his meeting with James and Peter and John, the freedom was put to the test. Now, it happened in the city of Antioch, the other city in our story today. This was a Gentile city, a large city, a city with a very large Jewish population, 300 miles to the north, if you can see from Jerusalem, Jerusalem at the bottom of the little map. It was in this city that Luke tells us Jews and Gentiles first formed a church where they worshiped together. It wasn't just like a one-off, it was every Sunday. And it was house to house. They sat together and ate their meals together, and they raised their kids together, and they studied God's Word together, and they prayed together. They were a brand new identity, a brand new people. In fact, it was there for the first time that outsiders, Greek-speaking outsiders, looked at this group and said, what are we going to call them? Because we've never seen anything quite like this before. And you know what name they came up with? Christianos, Christians. The word Christian was not invented by Christians. It was invented by non-Christians looking at Jews and Gentiles doing this new thing together in honor of their Messiah, their Christ. Brand new identity. Well, that was going to be the test case of test cases. Peter came and visited and entered in and had dinner with Gentiles and Jews. To sit at the table together was a big deal, you understand. It meant that you accepted that other person as family. It means, meant that we are one tribe. But things changed when some of the Jewish Christians from Jerusalem showed up. Paul tells us in verses 11 and 13, when Cephas, or Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas, Paul's partner, was led astray. 
Here was a freedom that Paul had worked so hard to preserve, which guaranteed that there'd be only one tribal marker for Christians, and that would be your faith in Jesus. And he's seeing all of that freedom go down the drain. Paul would have none of it, and he calls Peter out. Verse 14, when I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, wouldn't you have loved to have been there for that one? You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? Busted. Called him out. Peter was trying to walk two walks, trying to travel down two different paths. But freedom doesn't work like that. Think about it. The things that are happening in your life where God is taking you into a new freedom require you to make a choice. It's a binary choice. Either I walk further in the freedom that God has given me or I go back, back into some form of bondage. Either I embrace this new identity that Jesus alone has given me or I go back to being the person that other people tell me I have to be. Either I dare to believe that God can do a new thing in my life or I go back to seeing myself the old way, telling myself the old stories, hearing the old voices in my head. You can't have both. And Peter basically was like the guy, you know, with one foot on this iceberg and one foot on that iceberg, and when the two icebergs started going away, Peter had nowhere to stand. Peter had no doubt wished not to offend the sensibilities of his more conservative friends. But by being a hypocrite, Peter's mark on the world became a confusing blur that could be used to enslave people God had set free. No doubt, the hardest thing for Jewish Christians of Paul's day was to grasp that God had recreated what it meant to be his family. He hadn't abolished the old family. He'd expanded it. He had just defined it in, a, in, a, in the way that he'd always wanted to define it, once his son had come and paid for the sins of the world. From now on, there'd only be one tribe. And this is the enormous truth of the gospel, one tribe. That tribe would be designated not by race or culture. No longer would you wear on your body or demonstrate by your diet that you were part of the tribe. There'd only be one tribal marker, faith in Jesus the one who was faithful, who died for our sins and who God raised from the dead. Now, it's just as tempting for us today to divide people into tribes and groupings as it was in Paul's day. Think about how divided our society is. Think about how polarized our society is. Honestly, as a, a person of a certain age now, I can look back on a whole bunch of years of being an American. And I cannot even think of any time in my life that was anything like what we're going through right now. I mean, we used to quibble about whether you were Catholic or Protestant. That's small potatoes now. Now, the gap just seems to grow between the red states and the blue states, between the conservatives and the liberals, between people of faith and secularists. And, and, and we find that with every Supreme Court ruling and with every vote uh, in the legislature and with every presidential election, this is the most important election the country has ever faced. You ever hear that line before? They all are because there's more at stake and people are fighting and fighting and fighting against each other and we don't see any way for, for the bridge to be built. How tempting then to figure out which side we're on and think in terms of tribe versus tribe instead of God's one tribe. You see, in God's new creation, there's only one tribe. The people who have been set free from all of this bickering and all of this, these, these lesser identities and even false identities and all of the oppression and all of the the, um, uh, the pride and all of the attempts to force other people to be like me and think like me. We've been set free from all that to follow Jesus and become God's true children. Jesus was the one through whom God began the repair of his creation. 
Jesus is the one who conquered death and forgave sin. In Jesus, God introduced to a sorry and divided human race a new Adam, a fresh start for a new creation. The cemetery became the Garden of Eden. A cross became the tree of life. The exile that began when Adam and Eve were chased from the garden at odds with each other already became a new exodus of God putting us all back together again. Folks, as followers of Jesus, we're on a different project. We're on a different journey. We're going into a brand new place. And we're in the middle of a world that can't figure out how to get even one step forward without taking somebody else down. We're in a world that is going to look at you every day and sort you out. And people are going to go, hmm, okay, I think he's one of them, or I think she's over there. And I'm going to sort you and define you by this broken world's standards. God has called us to a brand new and different identity, one in which we're one tribe. It's important that we keep this in mind as we negotiate a fractured and partisan world. In its quest for fulfilling the promises of the Declaration of Independence, our Supreme Court recently extended the right to marry to same-sex couples. How tempting, once again, to sort ourselves out according to the latest social battleground. Well, are you for it or are you against it? Which group are you in? Where will our church stand? Will we be persecuted or will we compromise? And you see, while those are important questions, we have to remember that God called us to a different journey from all of that. We were never told that this world and its societies would be the kingdom of God. We're part of his brand new reform and repair movement that's going to go on regardless of what Supreme Courts happen to rule. It's going to go on regardless of how broken a society may be. We walk away from the world's old identities, both those we've chosen and those that have been pushed upon us. Only God can give us the courage to hold to his definition of what it means to be truly human. Only God can give us the convictions and the courage to stand for what his word says about what it means to be human. There will be times when our society doesn't like what God has to say about what it means to be human. We need to find the courage and the courtesy to have our journey and yet not get caught up in needless arguments. And only God can give us the grace to show his love to everyone, regardless of their tribe and regardless of their opinions, regardless of their behaviors. The new Exodus journey is there for anybody who dares to take it. Do you realize there isn't a soul on this planet who couldn't take the journey to follow Jesus? I've looked through the Bible many times, and I have not found any qualifiers. I've, nowhere have I found that you have to do this in order to begin to place faith in Jesus. But you can't be one of those in order to place faith in Jesus. The last life that Jesus touched was that of a condemned thief, probably a murderer, hanging on a cross next to him. Absolutely in terms of his society, the scum of the earth. And all that man had to do in the remaining moments of his life was say, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me. So remember, we're on God's project of taking people, whoever they are and wherever they are, no matter how entangled they are in things that we know are not good for them, he, God is calling them to that new journey. Who's going to walk alongside him, if not us? Who's going to walk with them? One tribe. Everybody will decide how long they walk and how far they go. That's really between them and God. I know I have enough work every waking moment to stay on the path myself. New Exodus journey is there for anyone who dares to take it. It's a journey that takes every one of us away from our present self. It's a journey in which we, day by day, discover, have revealed to us by God our new and true identity. And we travel as members of the one tribe that bears one tribal marker, faith in Jesus our King. So I want to encourage you, in times when the world seems out of control, and in times when 
the truth that God has revealed to us has been utterly disregarded, don't lose heart. That's part of the journey. We were put here to make a difference, not to be made comfortable. And we take that journey with God's love and with God's grace, recognizing that if we're looking for people who need fixing, we just look in the mirror. And everybody else that wants to come along, if there's someone that wants to join us, there's always room. There's always a seat next to me on the bus. We do that, we're going to find our true identity. One marker, faith in Jesus. Let's bow our heads together. Father, we need your help at these times. Our world has become darker and more confused. It would be very easy for us to think that we need to go and somehow fix it in our own strength. But we know that that won't work. So, Lord, we commit ourselves to letting you fix your world, your way, through us. Make us lights. Make us people who shed your love everywhere we go. Make us people who have convictions and then live them out. They say the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Lord, let our lives serve up good pudding. And Father, we pray. Pray for our land on this Independence Day. That Lord, the, the deep and heartfelt concern of those founding fathers would once again become a reality in our society. We would once again look to our Creator, to you, for those unalienable rights and recognize that they don't come from courts and they don't come from philosophy. They don't come from activists. They come from the one who made us ourselves. Only then are we truly free. Only then do we experience the glorious liberty of the children of God. Thank you, Lord, that we live in a land where we can, can still be free. Help us be good travelers in your new exodus. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I said to you that there's one tribal marker. It comes with two emblems, two symbols that Jesus gave us. What's it mean to really believe that Jesus died and rose again for me? It means to eat the food he gave us for the journey, which he said is his body, and which he said is his blood. Because as we're going to see next week, our identity is totally and completely inside of His. So I'm going to invite you as our elders come down at this time to prepare the table of the Lord to see the bread and the cup this morning as, again, that one way that we all together, regardless of who we are, say, no, I'm a follower of Jesus. And this is my food on that journey. The elders would come down at this time and we'll prepare the table for you.